if y'all want to sing with us this morning, we certainly encourage you to do so. Some days I touch the clouds Someday my best friend has been the cold hard ground There's mercy new each morning And a comfort through the night My eyes are fixed on Jesus And I'm gonna be alright I've got that hallelujah Feeling down in my soul I've got that hallelujah and it won't let go, yeah, I've been born again, yes, and amen, no matter what comes, I know I've got that hallelujah, feeling down in my soul, hallelujah, 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 oh, just because it's raining doesn't mean the sun won't shine, there's a season for the struggle and a season for the prize my hope is never fading because it's anchored in the truth my father goes before me and his joy will see me through i've got the this morning give them a shout out and say hi if you for those of you joining us online if you want to give us a shout out as well put your name in there and say howdy this morning
gonna have a seat for just a minute and we're gonna invite Joy to come up and give us a few announcements I bet this morning right he's distracted there we go thank you <laughs> good morning I'm Joy Munson. It's always good to see you on this Sunday morning at Horizons. Um, I have just two quick announcements. Remember tonight at 7 o'clock, Dan is going to do his presentation on the archaeolog archaeological dig that he was on this summer. And, um, and if you'd like to bring a snack to share tonight, just, as, you know, just to add to the fellowship, um, bring it. Um, we can make some coffee. And what a good time to invite somebody, um, friends or neighbors that might be interested in that. Just bring them tonight. But that'll be 7 o'clock here. And Wednesday night is Trunk or Treat at church which at 6 o'clock. Tonight's at 7, but Wednesday night's Trunk or Treat is at 6. And Catherine said she could really use some more cars. Um, people to come, bring their cars and have the treats, have candy to hand out of your trunk. If you want to dress up, you can dress up. If you want to have a theme, you can have a theme, but you don't have to. That's not a requirement, but some people do. Um, she could use a few more to participate. Um, if you could let her know ahead of time, that'd probably be great. Otherwise, I think she'd probably be thrilled if you just showed up, but that's at six Wednesday, seven tonight. That's all I have. That's all you've got. Well, thank you, Joy. We appreciate that. Well, we're going to encourage you guys to stand and worship with us this morning. And if you are at home, we're going to encourage you to stand and um, sing with us as well. I know a place where we can go to make the troubles down even your soul. i 
we're going to encourage you guys if you want to have a seat. And as we head into our prayer time this morning, if there's anything particular that you want lifted up this morning, Dan's here, Joy's here, they'll gladly pray with you. If you want to add something to the cross this morning, we've got a few over there that uh, we'll get to Dan at the end of the service. And it's just a great time for us to be together as a family. And if there's anything on Facebook that you want to lift up, knowing that that's a very public space, please know that we encourage you to do that if you want to share those out for the folks that will see that today or later on this week. Um, I know I've had several folks that come along and they'll say, yeah, I watched the service this week. And they didn't. They might not have joined while we're here today, but throughout the week they do go and, and watch it. And that's just an awesome ministry. That um, So when we share those out there, know that those folks that see it through the week, that they'll be praying with you too. So they do come alongside you through the week. to you, Lord, turn his face toward you, and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening, in the coming, coming, and you're going, and you're weeping, and rejoicing, he is for you, 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 he is for you. Before you and behind you and beside you, 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 and beside
I got here this morning I looked at the announcement sheet for today and there's always prayer requests on the bottom of it and all it said was Israel in the world and I was watching the news this morning um, the CBS morning show and there was a extensive story about what's going on in Israel and I turned it off and I'll just be real honest I just I just don't know how to pray about it and I just sat there, and I'm troubled, and I just said, God, I, don't, I just don't know how to pray. And the first thing that popped in my head was that, that tune we all learned as children, Jesus loves me, this I know. And even though we see the trouble and the unrest there and all around the world, and even things going on in our own country, there was a peace this morning as I sat there and just sang those words in my head that I am sure of and you can be too God loves us and he knows what's going on he knows the trouble and thank goodness we have an intercessor too for when we don't know what to pray or how to express it the Holy Spirit can take it for us um, let's pray together this morning Father God, thank you for the privilege of saying, I'm a child of God. And it's good to gather in this place this morning with my brothers and my sisters. And there's a comfort and a peace in that alone. Just the privilege of coming together and worshiping and singing together and reading your word and sharing with one another what troubles us, but also what's what we've been blessed by this week thank you for hearing our prayers and for the privilege of prayer and for hearing our prayers and knowing our voices when we say father god you're like oh yeah there's Rhonda, there's dan there's joy oh thank you father thank you for that and father we are troubled by the the turmoil and the war that we see and in, in other parts of our country and and just the unrest um, that we see even in our own country and disputes. And it is troubling. But, Father, um, thank you for the assurance that you're still God. You're still God. And you see all and you know all. And you're with us. You are with us every step, every minute of every day. Thank you. Thank you for Dan this morning and the scripture we're going to read today and the message I know you've laid on his heart. And I pray that for a little while this morning we can clear our heads of that that does trouble us or distracts us and we can focus on you for this time and what you want us to learn today, what you would teach us today. And thank you, Father, for, for Jesus. Thank you for a Savior. Thank you for loving us like you do thank you for your blessings for your grace and your mercy each and every day 
We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. And oh, how we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Ah, there we go. One other thing that I want I want to mention, John and Helen Johnston were here this week for two or three days, and and I had the privilege of having them at my house, and um, they left Friday to go to Richmond to keep Christopher's boys for the weekend. And on that trip to, Char uh, to Charlottesville, not Richmond, and on that trip to Charlottesville, John got word that his mother was having a heart attack. And, um, but prayers were answered and there was no heart damage one stent was placed and um, all was good and I think she was released the very next day so John just said thank you thank you thank you for all the prayers um, you know they were they were stuck basically you know they they couldn't leave and try to make a quick tip quick quick trip to Florida but just remember um, Betty Betty Johnston is her name All right, our scripture reading today is a New Testament reading from Matthew 21 and parts of 22. And I'll be real honest, I read it earlier, and this is a scripture that, yes, I've read it, but it may be one that you're not as familiar with as some others that we've heard over and over and over through the years. So follow along with me. I'm reading from Matthew 21, starting with verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. And they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Now in 22, it says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet, to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and, and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This is the word of God today for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. To be with you, my name is Dan Gray. I'm one of the pastors here at Pleasant View Church, and uh, delighted to see you. Uh, delighted to have you online with us as well. Um, I don't know about you, but I enjoy uh, going to parties, right? Anybody got any good costume parties coming up? Not that I'm going to crash it, because I'm usually the guy at the costume party that didn't dress up, except as me, right? <laughs> yeah, and most of the, the people who invite me to their parties, their costume parties, and I show up dressed as me, they kind of roll their eyes, and they're like, really? <laughs> that's all you could do? Don't you do theater? I'm like, eh, that's different. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know about you, but I remember um, parties, I guess, were always at least... At least getting the invitation to the party was always something you wanted, right? Even if you didn't really want to go to the party, you at least wanted the invitation 
to the party. I remember in the seventh grade, Maggie's house was a place for parties for us seventh graders. And her mom was a wonderful host, and she made all kind of goodies for us, and we loved to go to Maggie's house. Um, now, <laughs> one time I messed up a, I stepped on a pot. It's a long story. Uh, and I don't think Maggie's mom liked me being at the party anymore. <laughs> but um, I always like getting the invite and going to the party. And I think that's true about a lot of us. You know, sometimes you hear about a party that you didn't get invited to, and you're kind of like, hmm, why didn't I get invited to the party, right? Sometimes you um, get the invitation, and you're like, yeah, that sounds great. And then you start thinking about it, and you're like, well, who else is going? I'm not sure if I want to go to this party, right? Or, or sometimes you're going to go, and, and, and you say you're going to go, and you're planning to go, but then something better comes along, right? Or at least something better in your mind than the party, and you kind of like weasel your way out of it, back out of going to the party, change your plans because, you know, you'd rather do this, um, now, I don't know if you've been the host of a party and had that happen to you, uh, where you, people have RSVP'd and said, yeah, I'm coming to your party, and then they don't come to the party, right? And you're kind of going, huh, why do they think they're so special, <laughs> right? <laughs> why is it that they said they'd come, and what came up? And maybe there's, there's always good and legitimate reasons that a lot of folks have, but you know, for some folks, it's like, well, I decided to rearrange my sock drawer instead of coming to your party. Um, or I wanted to, you know, mow the yard, or I wanted to do this or that instead, or binge watch, you know, some latest episode on TV. And you're kind of like, okay, I see how it is. So this whole party idea is something um, that is fun for us when we go and we want to go. Uh, it can be troubling when we host and people don't come. And, and in first century Palestine, in Jesus' day, uh, they had parties. And there was that same human dynamic going on about getting invited to the party and going to the party and hosting the party and who's coming and who's not and did people find something better to do. And Jesus captures on that common experience of humanity and he tells this parable story about the great wedding banquet party. And he's illustrating some points about the kingdom of God. And so we're going to look at that passage today that Joy read for us from Matthew 21. Um, if you're following along in your Bibles, it's at the end of 21. It's rolling into 22. So it should be easy to follow uh, along if you want to. Oh, and hey, here's another thing. Uh, if you're into Bible apps, I discovered a new one this week. It's called Spark Bible App, and it's a great app. Um, version Bible App is a good one, too, if you're using that one. That's one I've recommended before. But if you want something on your phone, uh, Spark Bible App has some, some uh, not only just the Bible on it, but it's got some great readings and commentaries, and, and some amazing people are contributing to this to make it accessible, to, to just allow the Bible to come alive in your life. So Spark Bible app, app check it out. So um, follow along in your Bible app, follow along in your Bible. Uh, we're going to look at this passage, and we're first going to look at the setting, because I, you know, I really believe this, that, that the more you understand about where Jesus is talking, and who he's talking to, and what the circumstances are, all of a sudden the stories become a little more alive and we start to understand them better and we start to um, understand what God is saying to us as Jesus spoke to the first century hearers. Uh, so we're going to take a look at that. We're going to also um, find in this parable at least three things and there's probably a lot more but we're going to focus on three things today that we actually get from the parable once we locate it in its setting. One is that God's generosity and mercy is to invite all people to his party. Now, that's probably no great revelation to you at this point in your faith journey or wherever you are, maybe what you know about God. But that was important in Jesus' day to make sure that that was understood. And honestly, I think it's probably more important than we realize. So we're going to think about what that means for everyone to be invited to the party. Uh, the second thing we're going to look at out of this parable is that the rejection of, of the king's invitation is a rejection of the king's generosity and the king's mercy. And as we see in the parable, is considered a rebellious act of treason. So that sounds like a whole other level than saying to somebody, well, I'm going to rearrange my sock drawer and not come to your party because I just don't feel like it. That's a whole different thing. So we're going to look at that and try and figure that out. And we're going to understand that um, going to the party or not going to the party has consequences. And then the third thing we're going to look at is um, when we've accepted the invitation to go to the party, 
but we don't come to fully participate in the party, it has an effect on whether we can stay at the party or not. We can't just like show up and be a bump on the log and not do anything. And so we're going to explore that a little bit more too because there's this strange piece of the parable at the end that came in about the guy who gets kicked out of the party. We're going to try and figure out what that means. And then this all invites us to a next step of faith. As we encounter God's word every time, whether it's in your daily readings, whether it's you know in your worship time gathering, with God's people, every time the Word of God comes into our lives, it calls us into something new. It invites us in to something new, and I think that's true if we're uh, people who've been on the journey a while, um, attending the party for a while. Uh, we are invited into something deeper and newer with God in these discoveries about God as He's wooing us closer, drawing us into a deeper relationship, making a deeper commitment to Him perhaps today. And then also for, for folks who've never been on the journey with Jesus, um, this is your invitation to make a decision for him to choose to accept the invitation to the party. So let's look at this setting of the parable. So this is the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, and, and that always feels weird for me to say because Jesus still has very much a strong earthly ministry going on 2,000 years later. Amen? Amen. Good. Uh, but when we think about the incarnation of Jesus, this is the end of that life, the last week of that. And he's gone to Jerusalem with the disciples to celebrate the Passover festival, right? And later in the week, he will be arrested and crucified and then resurrected from the tomb. Everybody else doesn't know that. Jesus knows what's coming. Nobody else does. And what the, the people um, around him are thinking is, wow, this is a really great prophet. This is a really good teacher and a healer, and we want to hear him. So Jesus is hanging out in the temple courts. Uh, it's a big courtyard complex. He's hanging out teaching the people about uh, God's love and what it means to be a follower, a disciple uh, of his, which means to be one who is drawing closer into relationship with God. Now, Jesus has spent some of the week also challenging and confronting the religious leaders. We name them as the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. These are the people who are kind of in control of religious life in Israel. And they would set the pace for what it means to be in and out of God's favor. You know, they would help you understand whether if you did X, Y, and Z, does that mean that you are in God's favor or out of God's favor. And Jesus is challenging that, and he's been challenging that in several of the stories in the chapters of Matthew that precede chapter 21 and 22, where we are now. For example, he uh, has gone into the temple, and he's, he's turned over the tables uh, where they were exchanging money in the temple courts, and he's saying, look, you've turned uh, the house of prayer for God into uh, a den of robbers and thieves. And that's just not affecting the money changers. That's affecting the authority of the religious leaders because they've allowed that. And he's confronting them. And they realize this. They understand this very well because there have been other episodes too. And they decide that they're going to arrest him, but they actually fear the crowd's love of Jesus because they, the crowd reveres him as a prophet. So they don't make their move yet, and they're plotting against him. And this is the context in which the parable is given. The kingdom of heaven is like. Now, when I say that at this point, hopefully you've been around long enough uh, to hear me preach and say when, it, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, or if you've not been around, uh, and, and when you hear Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven, the idea is, is it's not just about a far off distant, you know, future utopia. One day we, we escape this mortal body and, and join the, the angels. We sprout wings and we fly off into the heavenly places. That's not what kingdom of heaven means. Now, kingdom of heaven invariably has some kind of eternal consequences, some kind of eternal effect on our lives. So what we do in this life does have an effect on that. And so when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven, whenever he says the kingdom of heaven is like, it's a clue to you that he's talking about how you live your life in the here and now that has eternal consequences, right? So it's not just about getting ticket punch for heaven and then you're in the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of god is a reality that jesus has initiated in this earth the kingdom of heaven is like a big old party a big extravagant party a big wedding feast a banquet that the king throws for his son that's what the kingdom of heaven is like and there's going to be a lavish meal a big old feast and 
And I want you to think of your favorite food. Somebody shout out a favorite food. An expensive favorite food. Lobster. Lobster's going to be at the feast. Filet mignon is going to be at the feast. Now, do y'all have this every day? I don't. Ira, what you got? Chicken. Oh, the best chicken you ever had, Ira. It's going to be at the feast. Lavish party. No expense is being spared because this is not just a party at Dan's house where, you know, he might like have some nice potato chips. This is a party that the king is hosting for his son's wedding celebration, a wedding banquet. So he's going all out, all out, and it's a lavish meal, and they're getting everything ready. Now, there are other parables that Jesus tells. Let me say this quickly. Um, There's a parable in Luke 14 about a wedding feast and a banquet, and it sounds kind of similar, but don't assume that this is the same story captured from a different angle by Luke. That may or may not be true, but also I want you to think about the hundreds, if not thousands of times that Jesus teaches going through all the towns and villages of Galilee, going through Jerusalem and and the areas of Judea. How many times has he taught and and how many times has he drawn on the common experiences of people? And so this parable is not necessarily that parable if you're reading later in Luke and somebody um, points you to it or you're, you're thinking of it. Uh, it was not unusual for a Jewish rabbi to use similar settings and, and to use um, things that were common to the people to talk about um, what it meant to be in God's presence and reign and favor and those kind of things. So Jesus is using something very familiar to them. Uh, most everybody hearing the story would have been to some kind of wedding banquet. Now, they probably wouldn't have been to a king's banquet, but they would have known kings because Israel had kings. Israel had the Herods during Jesus' time, but also there was the, the uh, Roman Empire that had its king, the Caesar, uh, uh, Augustus, uh, who was during Jesus' time. And, and so they saw opulence, and they saw lavish parties, and they saw uh, the wealthy having banquets, but also the wealthy of Israel would be having banquets sometimes. Um, so this is not a concept that's foreign to the people, even though we're talking about a king's wedding banquet for his son's wedding. If you look at the the scripture passage um, here, and also uh, actually throughout the Old and the New Testament, we often see references to the king. And here, you know, the the caution with the parable is there's not always a one-to-one correlation. The person in authority is not always God. But here, the parable suggests that the king is God, uh, that, that, that the king has unlimited resources to be lavish and generous. Uh, in in providing this this wonderful feast, this wonderful banquet. And so often the image of a feast, when you hear that used in the Bible, Old and New Testament, and in this parable, is is speaking to God's generosity and God's graciousness and God's mercy, how he's just extravagant um, with his love. This is uh, in the Old Testament before the period where coins were really around, and, and one of the ways that you showed your wealth and your your extravagant generosity was in hosting feasts for your neighbors and friends and family and especially on special occasions like this. And that metaphor continues in the New Testament where the image of the feast is a metaphor for God's extravagance. Now also in this parable we're seeing some allusions to the Messianic banquet and that was the expectation that the Jewish people had about a Messiah who was to come. And so we see in this a claim that Jesus is making about being Messiah as well. So that's some of the background of what we got happening in all of this. There's so much to say about this parable, but we're going to focus on these three things. The first one being God's generosity is to invite everyone to his kingdom party. Now, if you're hosting a a wedding party, which I know some of you've done recently, uh, you spend a lot of time planning that, don't you? Um, When Samantha and I got married, we we just, this was about 30 years ago when we started planning our wedding. We started uh, having this joke among ourselves that, that we were doing a big party for all of our friends and family, and then on the side we were getting married in a little ceremony. But it was the great wedding production, we dubbed it. And you spent months and months and months preparing for this and, and, and going over your list and sending out invites and checking who's RSVP'd uh, and then you know, meeting with the caterers. And, and uh, we actually had this really cool ice sculpture. I, I don't even know how we... I mean, it wasn't ever like, hey, I want to have an ice sculpture at my wedding, but the, the guy who was uh, catering, he said, hey, I can do an ice sculpture for you. So we were like, cool. So um, we had to figure out the ice sculpture too, though. You know, it just added another level of choice to what we were doing. 
that we spent a ton of time like figuring out seating charts and who's on the invite list and we wanted to invite everybody but we didn't have the money to pay for everybody we don't have the resources of a king uh, so we had to limit the list but but you know we were thinking about who do you invite you invite the the people who are close to you, you invite your family you invite your friends you invite your neighbors you invite people who share your lives right and I imagine that's what most of you have experienced too when you've either hosted a wedding uh, for a child or or you've been part of helping plan a wedding uh, for some friends or family or, or attending one you know there's some kind of connection usually who do you invite uh, to the wedding party well it's those people you know and you love right it's those people who are dear to you and you want to share this day and and usually it's people who are, are kind of in your social economic class right like, that wasn't a barrier for me and Samantha and anything that we thought about and who we invited, but, but just naturally, it's the people we're hanging out with who are normally people in our socioeconomic class. This is true in Jesus' day, too. They pretty much do the same thing. It's humans, you know, just inviting family and friends and neighbors and people in their socioeconomic class. Uh, but now, sometimes, if you had a very wealthy person uh, or even a king, they might invite the entire village to come. Yeah, because they have the resources to do that. Because this is a big celebration for the kingdom. Now, in Jesus' day, they had a, a kind of a system of inviting to weddings, uh, which is, I'm just going to call it the double invitation. And you would send out the invitation, um, and some of this is analogous to what I see done today, but some of it's a little different too. So you send out the invitation, you send out the invite to the party, and um, you are expected, uh, if you're a recipient of the invitation, to RSVP. They didn't call it that. That's actually a French term. But you're expected to respond to the invitation and let the, the host of the banquet know that you're coming. And then because they didn't have cell phones and, and online uh, registration databases for uh, letting your attendance be known, um, the, the servants of the wealthy person or the king would assist in gathering up that information getting your response, letting the king know, and then preparations were being made based on your response. So if you said, I'm coming to the party, the king goes, great, uh, I'm going to have filet mignon for you. I'm going to have lobster for you. I'm going to have uh, the best chicken you ever had for you. Um, and, it, and that's how they were prepared for. But then there was a second invitation. Uh, because um, especially the wealthier you were, the more extensive the preparations, and imagine a king's preparation, by the time you got to the banquet, enough time has passed where they need to send the servants out because they don't have cell phones and computers and um, Pony Express mail. You send the servants back out to tell the people who've RSVP'd, hey, party time. It's ready. The banquet is prepared. The feast is ready. The wedding celebration is beginning. Come on. And so they would have had some idea about when it is. They wouldn't be blindsided by that because you'd give them a general idea, but but to prepare that kind of feast, especially the larger the feast, the more preparations going into it, would take some amount of time. And so the servants would be sent back out to do that second invitation. So this happens in the parable. And what we hear in the parable, that invitation is the second invitation going out. It's not the first. It's the second. The people who've said they were coming have already RSVP. They've already told the king. He's made preparations to prepare the banquet feast for them. And so he sends the servants out back to them, and he says, it's ready, come on. Um, and what does he get? I don't know if they had crickets back then, <laughs> but you can imagine the sound of crickets now when you're hearing nothing else. People don't come. Well, the king says, you know what? I got lobster and I got chicken and I got filet mignon and I got prime rib and t-bone and ribeye and everything's ready and we're going to have a party because this is my son's wedding so servants I want you to go out into the roads and the fields and everywhere you can find people and just invite them all everybody gets an invitation and the servants do just that and it says they invite the good and the bad Whoever the bad people are, whoever the wicked people are, whoever the evil people are, they get an invitation to come to the party. Now, I know when Samantha and I did our great wedding production, I didn't sit there and analyze my list in terms of good and bad people. 
Uh, but I imagine just intuitively I was not inviting people I consider to be evil, wicked, bad. <laughs> people who have harmed me and done mean things to me, right? <laughs> who would you invite to your wedding banquet? There's some obvious people you'd invite to your wedding banquet, family, friends. Would you invite people who have different values and different beliefs? Maybe. Well, the king does. God does. Would you invite people who live in very different ways and have very different lifestyles? Maybe. The king does. God does. Would you invite people of different races and ethnicities and and who speak different languages and are from different countries and, and different cultures? Maybe. But the king does. People of very different socioeconomic classes. Maybe if you're in a a middle class or a wealthy class, you're looking to make sure the poor are invited. Mm, Maybe. But the king does. People who have very strong different political views, who really irritate you and bug the life out of you because they hold those so strongly and they're going to ruin your party when they come and start talking about modern-day politics. Not at the top of my list, but the king invites them. God invites them. What about people with a different set of problems from you that, that you perhaps um, are, are at least glad you're, you're, you're not involved in that in some ways? You know, maybe it's people who are uh, currently involved in addictions, or maybe it's people who've done a set of crimes that you're like grateful that you haven't done. Maybe it's the murderers that you now know. I don't know think murders and child molesters and people who abuse others are at the top of my wedding list invite. I doubt they're at yours. But the king does. The king invites them. Everybody's invited to this party. Second principle, a rejection of God's party invitation is a rejection of kings of the king's generosity and mercy and is seen as rebellious. Did you get that in the parable? There's some interesting pieces to this parable, and, and Joy, you were saying a lot, of, a lot of us might not be familiar with it. I think this is a, a weird one for us. It, it, it has some strange things in it that, that you kind of go, what does that mean? And when you read this in the parable, you're talking about the response of the invited guest who said they would come, the ones who RSVP'd and said, yes, king, Give me some good chicken. Give me some lobster. Give me some filet mignon. I can't wait to be there. King goes all out, prepares the meal, son's wedding, and then you're like, well, I gotta, I gotta take care of some business. I gotta weed the garden, you know, rearrange the sock drawer. I I gotta, I mean, the family have plans, you know. We something came up, and so what that meant in Jesus' day. was that that generosity and grace and extravagance of the king was being rejected in favor of some other things that those invited guests who said they would come have now chosen. Ordinary activities of life, especially business and money matters, taking priority over their response to the king. And the king's not happy. And this is where it gets weird in the parable, right? So what does the king do? The king sends out his soldiers, his troops, to punish those who said they would come and didn't come and to destroy the city. And you're like, oh, wow, that's a little harsh. A little harsh for our modern minds, at least, for the average Jewish hearer who were sitting in the temple courtyards listening to Jesus, they didn't have any trouble imagining that because they had seen terrible kings do terrible things. They had seen Herod the Great's rule where he murdered some of his very own family because he was paranoid. They had seen the Caesars take advantage of the whole empire at the expense of those who were oppressed, including themselves. So it wouldn't have raised an eyebrow for the Jewish hearer to have any imagination that a king would avenge the dishonor that the king had received. And in fact, they probably would have been sitting there going, why are these people so foolish? 
Is it not obvious that something bad is going to happen to them when they've said yes to the king and now they're saying no to the king? But also in the parable, we hear that when the servants go out the second time to say the banquet's ready, when the prophets go out, when the spokespeople for the king go out, the response to them is very negative. It's not only we're not coming, which is a, a very rude insult to the dignity of the king, because the, the messengers, the servants, are merely a voice of the king, and so they represent the presence of the king. So when you say no to the servant, you're saying no to the king. Not only is it an insult to the dignity of the king, but what did some of those people do? They abused and murdered servants so to attack the king's servant is to attack the king it's an act of rebellion and you see the response of the king to put down the rebellion and destroy the city which was the punishment for a city that was treasonous in Jesus' day the parable's audience while we've you know, I'm going, that still sounds kind of harsh. The parable's audience, the first century Jewish here, would have nodded their head and said, yeah, that's what a king would do. The king notes that the invited guests don't deserve the banquet. And the parable makes clear that our acceptance or rejection of the king's invitation has consequences. The kingdom of God is like a wedding banquet. And when we choose not to come to the king's banquet, we choose not to come into the king's presence. When we choose not to come into God's banquet party, we choose not to come into God's presence. And I wonder even today if we say that sometimes. I know you're king, Lord Jesus. I know I call you Lord. I call you Savior. I call you master and creator of the universe. And I really appreciate that you're hosting a party for me, but you know, I, I've got a lot going on right now, and my family and I, we got plans, the kids got, you know, they got a soccer game, I got to get some work done today, I, you know, I, my sock drawer needs rearranging, I'll come next week to worship, I'll pray tomorrow, I'll read my Bible tomorrow, I'll practice Sabbath when I have time for it, can't make it to worship today, you know, but maybe once or twice this month. Or maybe just ignore the invitation altogether. Third principle of the parable. If we accept the invitation but show up and show up, but we're not really participating as the king expects, it's a rejection of the king's generosity and mercy just as if we had said, yes, we're coming, and then we don't. Verse 11, this is where it really gets strange in the parable. So, so far, you're kind of like, okay, I kind of see the, the king's, you know, avenging his honor. That made sense in Jesus' day. You know, and so we're reading this with the modern minds, and we get to verse 11, and it just seems to get really strange. We've been hearing Jesus teach about how God's party is an invitation to everybody, Right? Everybody's welcome. You come just as you are. You go out into the field servants and you find the people who are poor and who are, are considered bad and who are considered evil. And you bring them with all the good people too. And everybody, you just come as you are. And, you know, we're going, yes, that's the God we love. And verse 11 feels like a little bit of whiplash. Because one of those poor guys shows up and he gets kicked out of the party. He gets disinvited from the party by the king because he's not wearing the right clothes. And you're sitting there going, how superficial is this king? And not only is he kicked out of the party, it's not like, go home, be thee well, but they bind his feet and cast him out into utter darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That doesn't sound like a good place. Sounds kind of harsh. And you feel this whiplash where everybody's invited, come just as you are, but wait a second, you you got to go. Right? So again, the Jewish context is important. Our setting is important. 
first century hearers would have understood that any invitation to a wedding party has expectations about how you go, including the clothing that you wear. Now, that's true in, in some of our culture today. That seems to have been lost in, say, the last 50 years. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing it's lost. It's just we don't observe that much in our culture today. You know, we, we dress more casually in about everything we do. Um, you know, I'm not wearing a coat and tie. And, and let me make this clear. This parable is not about wearing coats and ties to churches or fancy dress, dresses and hats. If Jesus never did that, he never expected that, he never called for that. So don't make that mistake. But in Jesus' day, to attend a wedding banquet, you would put on some nice clothes, at least clean clothes. And you say, well, what about all those poor people that the king invited in? He sent his servants out, and it, says, it sounds like they rounded them up real quick and came right to the wedding banquet. And so the scholars look at this in two ways. One is simply that when the king questions the poor man for not wearing wedding garments, he's talking about clean clothes. And the assumption is that he would have had the opportunity to get clean clothes on rather than soil clothes. Either he could have run by his house and put on some clean clothes, as was expected of the custom, which everybody else would have done. Or some biblical scholars believe that because of the king's immediate call for people to come in, as was some of the custom of the day in Jewish society, when you went to a very lavish banquet, sometimes the king or the wealthy person would provide wedding garments, a robe to put on. And so the idea is, is that whatever was expected of this man, whether it's clean clothes or a wedding robe, the man either had the opportunity to put that on or the king would have provided it. Because the man's response is not to say, I didn't have time, it's just to stand there in silence because he knew he was not conforming to the king's expectations. Either way, the man has refused to conform to the expectations of attending the party, the banquet. Now, in the Bible, we also need to know that throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, clothing is used as a metaphor. And that's important in the story that Jesus tells. We see that in the Old Testament that Jesus read and loved, that many times clothing is used as a metaphor for God's righteousness. In Genesis 35, 2, Jacob instructs his household to put on clean clothing before they enter into a covenant with God. It's a symbolic showing of your cleanliness before God, your righteousness before God. In Job 29, 14, Job, who... Um, was trying to trust in the Lord's righteousness. He says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. Isaiah 61.10, and we know Jesus loved the book of Isaiah. He quotes it many times. Isaiah 61.10, I will rejoice greatly in my Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me in the robe of righteousness. And listen to this. As a bridegroom decks himself out in garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. References to a wedding. And the New Testament continues the metaphor of using clothing for God's righteousness, God's salvation. Paul does it many times. He says, put on Christ, put on the clothing of Christ, the garments of Christ. He gives references to the the. Uh, um, I'm going to butcher them all, but uh, there's the, the passage in Ephesians and in, in Romans too where they're talking about uh, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of truth. Um, and, and I probably said that wrong, but you get the idea. Romans 13, 14, the phrase uh, put on Christ means to figuratively clothe oneself in the Lord Jesus Christ and reveal his glory to others. But, you know, even when we understand this, this is the part that we're still challenged by. Even when we start to understand what the parable means, this is the part that we're really still challenged by. Truthfully told, we don't like the part. We like the part of the parable where everybody's invited. That makes sense to our modern minds. We love that part. Everybody come to the feast. 
But we don't like the idea that staying at the feast requires that we conform to the expectations of the host. The one who put on the banquets. The one whose generosity and extravagance is being provided to us. It requires that we conform ourselves to the, in, the king's expectations, that we clothe ourselves according to his standards, that we don't wear the soiled garments, and that we put on his robe of righteousness. Because what that means is that we have to change. In Isaiah, there's another passage that talks about our righteousness before for God is filthy rags. Dirty garments. And without the king's righteousness, his robe at the wedding banquet being placed on us, we're stuck in our dirty garments. But if we start wearing the king's robe, that clothing of righteousness, that clothing of living right according to the expectations of the host of the banquet, it means necessarily that our lives will change. And that's what we're pushing back against. We want to come into the feast, but we don't want to change. In verse 14, Jesus gives the summary principle of the parable, which I think is often misunderstood. It's said this way, many are invited, but few are chosen. In, in your Bible, it may say many are called, but few are chosen. And sometimes we turn that into a predestination thing and, and, and um, God's elect are just a few handful of people, but that's not at all what this principle means. It's tied to the parable that many are invited, that the invitation goes out to all people, but that few are chosen, meaning that few actually enter in to the grouping of people that God is saving by putting on his robe of righteousness. And friends, that's always our choice. End. It's the robe of righteousness of God, but it's still our choice whether at the banquet we put on that robe and we live into and conforming to the expectations of the king. So friends, I think that raises some good questions for us today. Some next steps of faith, maybe coming out of these questions, you know, did you RSVP to guard's party? Did you say, hey, I'm coming? And then did you show up? Or did you find all these reasons, good reasons, why you couldn't do what you told God you would do? Maybe you ignored the invitation altogether. Maybe you showed up at the party, but you were still wearing some soiled garments. The invitation is come just as you are, but don't stay just as you are. God loves you so much that he's saying, come as you are and let me help clothe you. So what are you wearing? And there's the possibility that we're deceiving ourselves that the clothes that we have on are clean enough for the party. For the seeker, I think that invites you to accept the invitation to the party and be changed. And for the one who's on already at the party, to say, hey, God, can I have that robe? My garments are pretty dirty. I need that robe. And to put it on, and then not just magically, it's not an invisible cloak like you disappear with in Harry Potter. That robe of righteousness is a, a cloth of Jesus that covers you and transforms your lives into the being, the loving, gracious, serving, generous, giving person that Jesus is. You get transformed by wearing his clothes. May it be so with us in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can you pray with me? God, we, uh, we come seeking your word in our lives.
not just for information, but for transformation. And so give us, first of all, minds and hearts to understand what your parables mean to us in our modern context. And then give us your spirit to help us live into a fuller life. So it's not just head knowledge, God, but it's your righteousness that covers us and changes us and transforms us to be more like you. We are yours, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Dan. I certainly appreciated that lesson today. I, I learned something today, so... Um, because I was, I was saying, I'm like, what is going on in this? <laughs> so thank you for that context. I really appreciate that. So I hope you guys will stand and sing with us one last time. And let's just be grateful that um, he invites us to the party. I'm grateful for that. And that um, I'll do a little better tomorrow of putting on that robe. Stand with us and sing.
and worship with you today. And um, yeah, I hope as you're putting on your clothes as a daily activity, maybe that can just be in the morning that place where you're reminded about putting on the robe of righteousness and asking God's spirit to clothe you in his love and his grace and his extravagance and his generosity. What did you hear about the king? Lavish extravagance on others, good and bad, just to reveal God's love and mercy for others. So let that be your practice this week, wearing the robes of righteousness, drawing closer to God as you reveal his glory and love to others. Go in peace, go in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.